Hey internet, I'm Simon Squibb, your host at the Good Luck Club podcast. Our mission is to help anybody out there that's thinking of starting a business do just that. Equally, if you've started a business and are struggling, maybe you need a little bit of inspiration and knowledge. And we hope by interviewing some of the world's most successful entrepreneurs and change makers that you'll get the knowledge you need to become the person you want and turn your business into that dream company. I personally have started 17 companies from scratch and have invested in over 65 startups. When I sat down and analyzed how I did it, I discovered a secret. It was all luck. I'm here to tell you, in my opinion, without luck, it ain't gonna work. Each week, I will discuss with my guests this theory and see if luck is a skill as I feel that it is. I hope you enjoy our episode this week. Welcome to the Good Luck Club podcast. My guest this week is Sarah Jane Ho. She's the founder of Miss Wonder. She also has an institute and her very own TV show. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Simon. It's a pleasure. It's uh, wonderful to have such a clear signal from London to Shanghai. So let's hope the technology doesn't let us down this morning and our guests get to enjoy your story uninterrupted. Well, like Thanks to, to a VPN modem. Uh, yes. <laughs> Thanks to a VPN modem. Yes, so. yes. Well, we can get into VPNs. That's the, for those that don't know the, the system of getting around the firewall in China. But Sarah, I always like to start off the podcast by asking you just to introduce yourself a little bit to our audience. Yeah, well, um, I live in Shanghai and I teach etiquette. Um, When you think about what etiquette means, to me, it's really about combining charm and integrity. So that's knowing what to do in any situation gracefully. And I think that's one of the most empowering things for a woman or a man. Um, I think it means feeling capable and confident around other people. And I grew up in Hong Kong with my mother throwing dinner parties at home, Um, Now I like to do the same. And it's really special to be able to create magic moments between people through entertaining and putting guests at ease. So from a young age, I was traveling frequently and I immersed myself in many different cultures. Um, And I discovered that people all over the world, no matter whether they're from China or America, want to have a sense of belonging. Um, And this became really clear to me when a friend in China asked me for help because he was very nervous about how to eat at a breakfast meeting with Americans. Um, So I guess you could say that that's the time I unofficially began teaching etiquette. Um, And I I studied a lot of my time in the States. So from the age of 14, I went over there for boarding school. I went to Phillips Exeter, Georgetown, and Harvard Business School. Um, And when I was at, at HBS doing my MBA, I was thinking about what I wanted to do in life. Uh, And it hit me. Um, And even though I lost my mother to cancer when I was 21, I realized that I could keep her legacy alive by sharing the joy and love that she brought to others through entertaining. So I took a leap of faith and opened the very first finishing school for ladies in China in 2012. And uh, today that leap of faith has grown into several thriving ventures, um, including my TV show, the Sarah show, which is on both Beijing television, uh, Tencent video, and we're launching it this year on YouTube, um, as well as Wonder Shop, which is my e-commerce, which we just launched launched in May of 2020 this year, um, available only exclusively to the Chinese market. And uh, that's really just about, so the show's about sort of sharing lifestyle, um, and then the e-commerce is about sharing products that help our Chinese followers live a more positive life. Because when I think that, when you think about China opening its door to the world, um, it's important for me to be able to continue elevating women and giving them the tools to feel confident in any situation. Uh, And I think it's very important for, for China to be able to better express itself to the world and to be able to better understand the world. Wow, what a story. Why did you decide this route exactly, the etiquette route? I mean, you mentioned there the dinner party experience of home life and then someone asking you. But I I feel like etiquette generally is actually somewhat a cultural thing too. So how did you actually decide that was the path to take? 
Um, you know, on when you just said mentioned that etiquette is very a cultural thing, is very much a cultural thing. It is, and that means that etiquette can be different from, you know, from many from country to country. For example, uh, in China, when you eat noodles, it's actually not bad manners to slurp while you're eating your noodles because when you're slurping, it's showing how yummy the noodles are. Um, whereas in the West, if anybody slurped drinking their soup, immediately they'd be criticized by their parent as saying, that's very bad manners, don't make any noise when you drink soup. Um, so, but I think that when you bring it up to a higher level and think about what the spirit of etiquette is, it's really about making the people around you feel comfortable. Um, and so it's about putting other people at ease. And that's why I find that the way you know, some of my mannerisms, some of my things change depending on who I'm with. You know, if I'm with Chinese friends, I'm more Chinese uh, because that makes them feel more comfortable. When I'm with Western friends, I'm in many ways, you, the, the Western side of myself comes out. Um, and when I think about what got me into this, um, so, I mean, my mother is really very much my role model because she was a great entertainer in every sense of the word. And, um, she would teach me, even when I was a little girl, I mean, Hong Kong mothers, as you know, are quite tiger mothers. Um, and But one thing I think they do a very good job in is when their children are young, they will bring them up a certain way to know how to care for others um, and how to be considerate towards others. So my mother was always saying, oh, Sarah, look, you know, granny's teacup, she's finished her tea, go over and pour her some more tea. Um, and when I when she took me on a business trip to to Japan, um, there was a very senior Japanese businessman there and everybody seemed very afraid of him because Japan's so hierarchical like that. And my mom said, oh, you know, that's that's Mr. Sato. Go over and run over to him. He has a daughter your age. Ask him when his daughter is going to come to Hong Kong and offer that, you know, you'll play host and take her out to play. And, uh, and she said, oh, by the way, don't call him Mr. Sato. In Japan, it's Sato-san. So these sorts of mini things, mini etiquette lessons, combined with later on when I, I myself went to Swiss finishing school um, in, in a very small little village uh, in the middle of nowhere in Switzerland, but was so inspired to bring that concept over to China, is what led me to do what I do today. I, I wanted to interview you for so many reasons. Your, your story is just fascinating to me. But one of the things that I personally connect to and I want the audience to pick up on is I've lived in... Asia for 20 years and I've lived in England for 20 years. The first 20 years of my life was in England. The second half of my life was in Asia. And it's funny because when I'm in Asia, everyone wants me to connect them to the culture and the people in, in Europe. And when I'm in Europe, they, everyone here wants me to connect them to the culture and the business opportunities in Asia. And I find that you know I end up having these conversations about the nuances of each market. And actually, I've come to the conclusion that if I'm advising people that are listening out there, you know, if you want to do business in either of these two markets, it's just be yourself. I think that's what the story you just told there, really. Your mum has said, don't listen to the hype of that person over there. Just go and say hello to him. Be normal. Express something you're interested in personally. And, and cultural divide can be bridged through politeness. Do you think that's fair to say? Absolutely. And I think a lot of people have a misconception of etiquette. A lot of people think it should be taught by a middle-aged lady with a hair in a bun, wearing some sort of suit. We should be, you know, her horoscope should be a Virgo. Yeah, making you wear and, books on your uh, head and walking straight, I, you know. <laughs> Those the, in England, if anyone of my listeners in England will listen to etiquette, they'll, they'll, they'll reject it as this kind of strict uh, a, a thesis around how you should behave as opposed to understanding what you're actually doing. That's right. And, and I think people think a lot of it is about pretense and about putting on mannerisms. But one of the things that we tell our students is that when you're holding a teacup, the last thing you should do is have your stick your pinky out. <laughs> Which I do on purpose to be English, just <laughs> just for fun. But I know exactly what you mean. You know, and, and, and so I think that true etiquette is just about being authentic. Um, but at the same time, you know, putting other people at ease and just being considerate to, to other people's feelings and and how your behavior can affect other people's behavior. So today's business environment in in china it feels complicated but for my listeners um, outside china you know what 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 do you feel i mean for example on your personal level what do you see as success and do what, what do you think people in china see as success now well i think that in china as in any developing country um which you know if you look at russia 
if you look at America a hundred years ago, um, success means money. It's very material. Uh, still and, the case uh, in China today? Is it still like that now? Um, yeah, because you have to realize, I mean, Li Keqiang, who's our state premier, he just said on Friday that 600 million of the ch- people in China still live under 150 US dollars a day. That's 600 million out of a population of 1.4 billion. So, um, of course, we hear about the rich in China. There are lots of rich people. But if you look at, you know, sort of the whole ratio of the population, most people are not rich. Um, so I think that, so just as in, for example, when America came up a, a, a hundred years ago, right, America, you had these robber barons um, and they were so rich and they were going to Italy and they were buying up antiques in cash. And the Europeans thought they were terrible and ill-mannered and, you know, so cash rich. Um, but so I think that, you know, given that I grew up in Hong Kong, which is really East meets West and also spent a lot of my time uh, in the U.S., in Europe and now in China, to me personally, uh, success is about doing doing what I love. So I wake up in the morning, I have a job that I love. Financial independence is very important for me. Being able to travel frequently and also being able to add value to society. And so I think the goal is never to be successful. The goal is to be valuable. And once you're valuable, everything else comes along. Mm. I've uh, the next podcast I've got is with Adele Lim. She wrote Crazy Rich Asians. Do you think that's quite an authentic projection or interpretation of what happens? Uh, so I didn't read the book, but I watched the movie and I love the movie. And a lot of it is very on point. And it is when you look at Hong Kong, um, Singapore, I mean, it's it's all very small. Everybody knows each other across, you know, Taiwan, um, South Jakarta, KL. And so I really enjoyed it. I thought it was um, a, a, pretty, a pretty good reflection of, of how a certain part of society is. Um, so I enjoyed the book. And so what was your question again? Do, do you, it does represent you know, the Asian lifestyle at a certain intersection. So for example, you know, the, the, the poor um, girlfriend or boyfriend dating the rich uh, boyfriend or girlfriend uh, dynamic. So the family wants you to marry money, not marry for love. Is that is that's the interpretation? One part of the interpretation I have of that movie. Do you think that's true? Well, um, firstly, I think you have to realize that marrying for love is a fairly new concept. If we look at the past, you know, if you talk about AD, the past two thousand years, um, marrying for love really only came out mid-century. Before that, a lot of it was arranged. Um, and in some countries, it still is arranged. So I, I do think that as in any class of society, you know, wherever you are around the world, um, there'll always be people who will be quick to judge, to say, oh, well, you know, if you see an imbalance anywhere, in age, in wealth, in success, it's very easy for people to then have opinions. But I think that it's I think that you have Asia and then you have China. So I don't think you can really consider, you can talk about Asia and just sort of lump China in. Um, It's really Asia and then is Asia X China and then there's China. Yeah, I would I would say again for the listeners benefit that you've got China and then you've got different provinces of China. So it's just like the US really. You've got New York culture and you've got Texas culture you know so i think it's very much like that in china too right and beijing's quite different to shanghai and then you go to the second tier cities or the third tier cities it's it's almost a different dynamic again is that true oh very different very very different i mean i was uh i i was i went to work this morning and it's rainy season in shanghai right now um and i live in a you know i, I work in an office tower and i was like 100 meters away from my office tower and there's a big podium out front with fountains and I saw everybody, a, a long line, a hundred meter long line of Shanghainese queuing with their umbrellas because now, because of COVID, everybody has to, there's an extra security measure where you have to scan your health code. Um, and in Beijing, that would never happen. Beijing people would do, do not, they do not have a concept of standing in line. It's just, you get up to the front, you butt your way in uh, and, you know. <laughs> yeah, interesting because in, in England if you butt your way in um, you, you get into a lot of trouble you, know, you, you end up in a fight so um, you've got to be very careful I, I, I'm interested I mean I feel like China and you're right I mean Asia China they're different but um, th- th- that, that part of the world now generally is 
into entrepreneurship. It feels like it's it's definitely becoming more mainstream, I guess, with folks like Jack Ma and Alibaba, these folks doing well. But I have two questions for you, really. One, do you think entrepreneurs are born or bred? And is, you know, is, is the future of Asia or China entrepreneurship? Um, so to answer your first question, I think that they're both born or bred, but with more of an emphasis on bread. Um, in terms of born, it's really the personality that you're born with. Um, even if you look at, say, Western horoscopes, I mean, a, a personality of a Leo versus that of a more conservative Virgo, um, these are things that just you're born with. But then your upbringing, I think, a child's upbringing in younger years by your parents is one of the most defining factors in your life. You know, it, that'll define whether you're, you're secure how you treat other people, whether you're comfortable taking risks, being out of your comfort zone. And I think that for me, well, I'm a Sagittarius, so I'm naturally sort of act before I think kind of person, which is great for entrepreneurship, not good for some other things. Um, but but also my parents really encouraged me to, to chat with strangers, to they would send me off to summer camp um, in, in Germany where nobody could speak German. And I had to, you know, I learned a foreign language. They did the same for me in France. So I was very comfortable with being out of my comfort zone. Um, and I think that that also is what, I think that combined with just persisting, you know, in the face of failure over and over and over again. Um, and it takes a lot of thick skin. So that's my answer to your first question. As for your second question about whether Asia or China needs entrepreneurship, uh, So what's interesting is that in China, um, because of historical events, because of the Cultural Revolution, the people were very, very poor. Even, you know, 30 years ago, people were very poor. And a student of mine who, a client of mine who actually later on, I mean, their couple's business became very, very successful. Uh, The father told me that on his birthday, um, and he's born in 1970. So he said that on his birthday when he was young, his, his mother would give him an egg. I mean, that's how poor they were. Uh, and now they have a very successful couple's business to the point that when Hu Jintao, the previous president of China, and Xi Jinping, the current president of China, when they both went out to visit overseas countries and they would bring business delegations, this couple, the father was chosen twice. So, um, And so the first generation of wealth in China is all entrepreneurial. Um, they, it was really just about survival and They didn't, some of them dropped out of primary school. Um, A lot of them didn't get to go to university. So now the second generation um, wealth, and that when you hear about sort of the second generation wealth, it's those first generation's kids. um, A lot of them studied overseas and were very inspired by what they saw in New York, in London, um, wherever else. And uh, they brought those ideas back with them to China and and want to either want to take the family business to the next level. So if their parents had a factory, now they the kids want to make their own brand, um, or they want to you know make it update it for the technological age, uh, and um, or also what you had Li Keqiang again, our, our premier, uh, about five six years ago came out and said everybody should start a business, and he made this an official party line. So but then you had all these people that were not necessarily suited um, or, you know, not necessarily, they maybe should not have really been better off starting a business. Everybody's starting a business. Uh, and, and then the big cities became very overcrowded and, and then, you know, there was some negative side effects of that. Uh, I think that there's a place for everybody. Um, there's a place for everything. So it's very hard for me to say that we have to have more entrepreneurship to survive because, a lot of the big companies also do need a lot of very good workers um, to be stable and not everybody necessarily wants to come out and build their own business. Yeah, I think that's actually also happening in in London and New York. I see people that become entrepreneurs because it's cool now, Um, but maybe they they shouldn't be entrepreneurs (laughs) for various reasons. I think the main reason is not that people don't have the ability because I think there's eight different types of entrepreneurs. There's there's the Mark Zuckerberg inward um, kind of techie type entrepreneur and then there's perhaps us more outgoing profile type entrepreneurs but I do think a lot of people misunderstand what being an entrepreneur is 
they, they see it as something glamorous and when in reality it's hard work a lot of failing as you said earlier right so it's interesting just to understand I, I do see a lot of amazing businesses and entrepreneurial folks coming out of China now I would say that they're competing with the US uh, brand names you know I keep mentioning Jack Ma but he's just one of many right there's there's many many people now that are coming out of China with these amazing businesses that often are three or four times bigger I mean I was, I was looking at Alibaba's numbers they're, they're three times bigger than Amazon <laughs> if people don't conceive this concept they think Amazon runs the world and there is a competitor that is three times bigger than them <laughs> Um, but, but, but yeah, I mean, what, do you think China entrepreneurship, I mean, the perception in the West is about the concept that, um, you know, you're restricted in China as an entrepreneur. You, you can do business there, but you're restricted. A bit like Facebook is restricted in, in China. Do you, do you feel that's true or that's just a misrepresentation of the China brand? So I think that, I think we should think about why Facebook is restricted in China. Facebook even overseas and in the UK most recently has come under a lot of fire for fake news um, and for influencing things and letting people, I mean, it, it just, uh, there, there are reasons that I think that Facebook is not allowed in China because it's because of political reasons and it's for national security. Mm, and um, there is an argument look, they should, they should be doing that in the West too, restricting it from political ads and so on. Right. So there's some, see, this is the thing I have sometimes with China. I think people misunderstand China. It's, it's in a way trying to stop unrest. Don't get me wrong. It's got its flaws, but with Facebook, I think it's a good example of, yeah, I agree with you. Sorry, I interrupted you because I completely agree with you. <laughs> and when you think about it, China has a population of 1.4 billion people. You know, the West thinks that thinks that democracy means success. Think the West thinks that every other country should be ruled by democracy. But actually, not everybody wants to be ruled by democracy. And if you look at polls that have, if you look at polls of the youth in Europe, the youth in America versus the youth in China, and how they view their future, the youth in China view their future much more positively than those in the US and Europe today. They see hope. They know that if they work just towards something, that they can make something of themselves. And I think that the, I think more importantly, that the responsibility of a government is to make the best decisions for the majority of the population. And democracy is not necessarily the golden egg to that. Um, so I think, I mean, I, I think that there's a reason that, China doesn't doesn't allow Facebook, et cetera, in China. Look at the Arab Spring. They learn from that. Um, so so that's the Chinese social, uh, that, that's the Facebook side of things. Now to answer your question about uh, whether entrepreneurs feel, feel, you know, held back in China. Um, so what is amazing about China is that nothing is easy. Even paying your electricity bill, you know, until we had WeChat pay, like paying your electricity bill, even as recent as eight or nine years ago, you had to physically go to the bank and show a bunch of stuff, including, you know, your, your, your lease agreement and, and, and your ID, uh, like passport. And then you had to pay that way. Um, you know, setting something up, like there's so much bureaucracy. I had to, I had to renew my driver's license a month ago. And because I'm a Hong Kong passport holder, I mean, it was just like, I was sent on three wild goose chases in three different places on three different days in order to do what I had to get done. But then the beauty of it is that nothing in China is impossible. So let me say that again, nothing in China is easy, but nothing is impossible. And so when I ask my staff to do something or, you know, to go figure something out and they come back and they say, oh, but we can't do that. I say, well, what if we do it this, this, this way, or, you know, find a way or, and then I give them, you know, seven other possible solutions and say, explore each of these. Then they come back to me and they say, oh, okay, actually, you know, it is doable. Um, it, and, and so I think that's what's really fun about being in China. Uh, in some ways it is the wild, wild west, but that's why it's great for entrepreneurs because usually entrepreneurs are very strong willed. Um, they have a lot of ideas and, uh, and it helps to be in a place like China. So there's a lot of possibility here. I, I feel there's no other place I'd rather be starting a business in China. Do you you feel like you're a Hong Kong person? Where do you, where do you kind of see as home for you? 
Uh, it's funny. I just posted a post on Instagram this morning. Um, and I said, uh, in my post, I said that, well, firstly, recently, a former colleague of mine, he was actually a, a, a partner at a boutique investment bank I worked at in New York out of college. Um, he messaged me and he said, since when did you become so pro-China? It's so sad. And I, and I said, you know, Richard, um, in case you haven't forgotten, I'm from Hong Kong. And so I am actually Chinese. And so I posted a post today, which was a picture. Wow. That's of, uh, of me. Yeah. I, carry on. Sorry. The controversy. I want to go watch. We should all go look at the post now, but go ahead. <laughs> so, so I posted a picture that I'd taken 10 years ago using my Blackberry in Blackberry days um, of my seat and my view from the seat with my name card. It says Sarah Jane Ho. And I get, and, and you see like each, each section at Harvard Business School has 90 students and you're, you're seated in like the semicircle um, setting, almost like an auditorium. And every student in section is represented by a flag. So you'll see all these colorful flags that hang down from the wall. And it just so happened that this photo of mine captured all those flags. And I said that, I said that, you know, pro China and pro Hong Kong don't need to be mutually exclusive. The Western media treats them you, you either or. If you're pro China, that means you're, you know, against Hong Kong. That's not true. And for me, 10 years ago, because I enrolled at HBS in, two, in 2010, when I, and, and, you know, there was obviously a conversation about, oh, you know, Sarah, how do you feel? Do you want the Hong Kong flag up there? And I said, I don't mind because Hong Kong is part of China. So I'm actually equally happy to have the Hong Kong flag there or equally happy to have the China flag there. You know, it's like if you have an Ohio flag and a USA flag. So I, I said, I don't mind at all. And in my section, there were three mainland Chinese students, one of them whose father was mayor to uh, mayor of Beijing. And, uh, and he, at that time, he was a current mayor. And, and they said, no, Sarah should have a flag. They said, we're, we're equally happy for, for Sarah to, to be represented by her Hong Kong flag. And so, and, and so in that photo, it's actually, it's smack in the middle of the photo. You will see the Hong Kong flag, which has the Bohemia flower and it's lying side by side next to its flag from its mother country, China. And let's not forget that the British, sorry, Simon, I know you're British. The British took Hong Kong by force in 1841 and China took it back by peace in 1997. Yeah, I I am um, I am British, but to be honest, I have um, a, a confusion because I I'm I'm I love things about China, and there's things I don't like about China. There's things I love about England. There's things I don't love about England. There's things I love about the US, and there's things I don't love about the US. And I think it's interesting how people are, um that are so binary. You know, it's like you either like or you don't like. And I and I always feel like in in Hong Kong, for example, I actually worked with the Hong Kong government, and I got a lot of trouble into a lot of trouble with it. Because people would say, why are you working with those people? They're pro-China. And my, my thought was, well, if we want to make the place a better uh, environment for us all to live in, then why don't we contribute to fixing the problem instead of just fight the problem? So it's not what I hate that I'm going to stand for. It's what I love that I'm going to stand for. And I, I feel that's what you're saying. You know, I feel, I feel like, you know, the pro, and it is interesting also, I often used to say Hong Kong, China, and, I, and people would get really upset with me. It's like, no, no, it's Hong Kong. It's not China. I'm like, what's the harm? <laughs> and I, and I, but, but again, people will pick up, even in this broadcast, I can just see now lots of, of negative comments because I think people will pick up on the wrong points. They'll, they'll pick up on the fact that, yes, there's some laws in China that perhaps in Hong Kong are not perceived as positive, And I totally understand that. But like you're saying, you sometimes have to, even in democracy, if your candidate wins in, in, in the presidential election, all the things you care about are no longer implemented. Right, So you have to wait four years <laughs> to elect the person who cares about the things you care about. So in other words, you've got leadership that's doing exactly the opposite to what you actually want, even in a democracy. So the only, only, only way to... At, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Look at, case in point, look at America. And I have a great fondness for America. I think it's one of the best places you can get an amazing education. I spent 10 years of my life there. So many of my close friends are American. And they are so upset about what their current president is doing to their country. And in fact, today, there was an article in Bloomberg that said Chinese officials are actually warm to the idea of Trump winning and ruling for another four years because they think the damage it will do to America <laughs> as king of the global order 
is better than the harm it'll do to China. So it does highlight the flaws in democracy, doesn't it? It highlights that, you know, it doesn't matter the leadership in the end. This is actually what I love about Hong Kong during the coronavirus, for example. I mean, Hong Kong's government, you know, is I, I, I work with them, so I want to be uh, careful. But ultimately, they, they, they have their problems. But, you know, ultimately, what I love is the people, the people themselves are so resilient. They are self-isolated. They controlled the coronavirus in Hong Kong themselves through uh, education and, and intellect and common sense. And so, you know, people are blaming governments in England or blaming governments in America. And ultimately, it's the people in the individual states or the individual locations that are actually the problem, right? Governments shouldn't be in such control. I mean, you know what, Sarah? I think for you and I, I could, I'd like to have a whole separate podcast on the political side of this because I think it's worth unpacking. And um, today's broadcast for me is really about un- understanding you as an entrepreneur and understanding the entrepreneurial ecosystem. But I'm fascinated by the politics politics of it all so I can easily get distracted but coming back to the entrepreneur piece I mean you as an entrepreneur fascinating how you've mentioned your mother a few times as inspiration what about your father how did he play a role in 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 who you've become so my father um and he actually spent a lot of his time in the UK so he studied in the UK and uh so in some ways he is quite Uh, I mean, he's obviously Chinese, but, you know, he also has a very English side to him as well. Um, And my father is, you know, whereas my mum would say, so, for example, I went off to boarding school at Phillips Exeter in in New Hampshire in in the States. And my mum said, I have a, I had a gift for you. I said, oh, you know, what's the gift? And uh, it was a weighing scale. And she said, we we always hear about how so uncle so-and-so's daughter, blah, 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 son went to America and gained 20 pounds, went to England, gained 20 pounds. Please don't gain more than five pounds. My mother was 95 pounds, very skinny. You know, she took very good care of herself. And, uh, and that first semester of school, it was so cold. New Hampshire winters. Oh, um, every day I had a Mars bar dipped in a vanilla chai latte, sometimes twice a day. And so needless to hungry. say, the first three months, you know, by the time I went back to Hong Kong for Christmas, I'd gained 10 pounds. Um, and so, and so, you know, so whereas my mom was, you know, very openly unhappy, very, always very demanding of me, very critical of me. My father would say, oh, you know, I got you a gift. I'd go, what is it? And, uh, it would be a bicycle and he'd say, oh, you know, it's just so that you can get some fresh air and do some exercise whenever you want to. Um, I remember I, I got a very, very low score for a mathematics, mathematics exam. It was something like 72%. And my dad said, you know, I, I was crying. I was very upset. You know, when you're in high school, these are kinds of the dramas of your life. And uh, my dad said, well, do you feel like you did your best? And I said, yes. And he said, as long as you did your best, I have nothing to say. You know, that it's, it's okay. Just try better next time. And so that's always how my father was. He was always very, um, very warm, very supportive, even with, starting this business uh, because before Harvard Business School, I actually spent, I was a full-time volunteer um, for a nonprofit. It was called Walk High. It's since closed now, but it was started by two young American girls who were on a Fulbright Scholar in China trying to help with poverty alleviation in, in rural China. And so even though I was based in Beijing, I was frequently going to Shifeng in, in Mongolia and to Yilong in, in Sichuan province. Um, and, you know, visiting a lot of farmers and just being there in the field. Uh, and so after, so when I was at HBS, when I graduated from HBS, I said, daddy, you know, I think I kind of want to start, I have this idea and I kind of want to start an etiquette school in China. Um, and my dad said, he said, if there's anybody can do it, it's you. China needs it. And if there's any time it's now go do it. And I, I thought, wow, you know, and, and so I thought, well, I was like, but you know, what if, what if it doesn't work and this and that, but I said in six months, you'll know if it works or not. And what is the worst case scenario? You go back to doing poverty allevi- alleviation for China, go back to doing nonprofit. There's no downside. And I thought, oh yeah, actually that's true. Um, and so, you know, he was really a big, I mean, he's my rock. My dad is absolutely my rock. Um, and, and actually, what's funny is that before doing the etiquette school, I actually for a while had a plan to move to Africa because I had a lot of African. My best friend was half African, half Swiss at Harvard Business School. And, uh, and so she kind of pulled me into the African student club. And 
for a while, for two months time, I was like, oh, maybe I want to move to Cape Town and see what's there. And I remember I'd call my dad and I said, daddy, I really, I think after HBS, I might move to Cape Town. And my dad said, the world is your playground, go explore. Which is not something that many Asian, let alone Hong Kong fathers would say. It's interesting. I think there's a lot of talk about Asian mothers and, and like you mentioned earlier, the tiger mother um, concept. But the, the fathers um, seem to have a very varied image. That's right. Was, was your father an entrepreneur? Um, he, in some ways he was, in some ways he wasn't. So, I mean, he did move to Papua New Guinea to do oil exploration, uh, which was very entrepreneurial. Um, and that was, the, you know, they lived there for four years. So I think that, but then again, he's a Virgo. So he's also very measured. He's very, he thinks things through very carefully. So um, I think that Asian fathers are very different when it comes to treating their daughters and their husbands and their sons. I think that Chinese fathers are tougher on sons. Um, and uh, whereas for their daughters, it's like, yeah, go travel the world, you know, go be an artist, go, you know, do whatever you want. Um, so, yeah. Well, again, it's just not the image I think people in the West have. I feel like the image is you know, the tiger mum approach is same for both the daughter and the son. You've got to be brilliant. And then the, the father approach is this mixture of, um, you know, go and be a good wife <laughs> or, or, or go and go and be um, go and be something that I can hold up as, as a, you know, my, my daughter's a doctor or, or um, but you, you feel, you know, your father was different or that's very typical. Was your, was your father from Hong Kong? Yeah, he was. He my, Both my parents were born in Hong Kong. My grandparents on both sides fled China. One fled because of the Japanese invasion and the other fled because of the communists um, because they were both business people. Um, and so, so I think that, uh, no, I think my, my father's unusual. I mean, I was an English major. That was also unusual. Um, but generally speaking, Chinese parents like, as you said, like their child to do something that they can hold up and compare. It's almost like the Indian parents, you know, it's like, oh, my son goes to Harvard. Oh, my daughter goes to Yale. Uh, that kind of thing. And, and then they want you to do a useful degree. So that, that usually leads to being a doctor or being a lawyer or being an accountant. <laughs> useful degree. I don't think there is such a thing. Interestingly enough, but I, I wonder, I mean, I, I have a similar experience even in Western culture for myself. You know, I, I left school at 15 years old and became an entrepreneur. My mum was very disappointed. You know, they wanted me to be a lawyer. That's what they had me pegged as. So I think there was an element of, oh, he's an entrepreneur. He's always going to be poor. <laughs> so I, I don't know, you know, if, if in, again, if in China that's changed, if, if, some, if you say to someone, oh, I'm an entrepreneur, I've got my own TV show, I've got this, I've got that. Is there, is there respect or is there still an element of like, what do you do? You couldn't get a job. Is that why you do all this? <laughs> so actually I, I read about, you know, what your first job was gardening. And, yes. and then you built that into a, you know, you had multiple contractors for your gardening business, um, which I really admire at the age of 15. Uh, and as in China, yes, it's almost like, you know, chuang ye. So, so the word for entrepreneurship is chuang ye. And it's almost like this badge, like, oh, you know, this is my friend. She's, you know, chuang ye. She's an entrepreneur. And it, it does almost seem like the golden halo. Everybody's chuang ye for the sake of chuang ye. <laughs> Good word. I want to remember that. Do you um, think luck plays a role in business? How do you view luck? Have you had good luck in your life, bad luck in your life? How, how do you view it? I think I've been very, very lucky in my life. Um, I've been very lucky to have had the opportunities I've had to be able to go to the schools that I've had. And in terms of timing, um, you know, even let's say when I graduated from uni in 2007, I graduated from Georgetown, we all got jobs. It was the best it was the boom year. It was the hype of finance and consulting. A year later was the financial crisis. So all my friends in the class after couldn't find jobs. Um, when I think about when I graduated from HBS and came to China to start my etiquette school, actually, I'm sort of right person, right place, right time. Uh, if I'd done it earlier, I was still kind of early, but at least I was you know, sort of the first to do it and, 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 and a lot of people noticed. Um, but if I did it earlier, China really wouldn't have been ready because you kind of need to make your money before you're ready to think about 
you know, all the other things, including respect and etiquette. Um, and then if I were later, then, you know, my, I mean, there, there could be a lot of girl, other girls like me. So the fact that I'm from Hong Kong, I'm sort of the right mix of East and West has helped. Um, the, the fact that I grew up horse riding and I'm a competitive show jumper, but at the same time, I love fashion. And I went to Harvard business school, went to the, you know, good boarding school, all these things kind of just kind of have, have, have been able to, um, it's almost like I did all those things that, that it's almost like all those things in the past helped me with what I'm doing now today. Cause then I entered in the Longines masters competition in Beijing. Um, and obviously, I mean, not that many etiquette teachers are able to have that both sort of the bicultural bilingual and comfortable in so many different worlds and sort of have that background that gives the student, the target students that you want the credibility to feel like they want to come to you. Yeah, I think when I read your background and what you've done, uh, my interpretation is that you have quite a privileged upbringing. Yet when I listen to you, how you're building your business and how you're doing things, you, you're very gritty. You're very, you know, uh, you're fighting. I feel like you're fighting to build something. So I often don't see th that combination. You know, like some, some, a lot of people that I see that have had money, they could easily pick a comfortable lifestyle. Like you said, go work in a nonprofit, which is very purposeful, but not necessarily go out there and build your own company, which is painful. So how come, you know, what, what happened? Why, why, why are you like this? What's. It's funny when you use the word gritty, that's totally what I am. And, um, and I think even my, my family is a bit sort of taken aback. Uh, and, and my grandmother always says, why are you working so hard up there in mainland China? Everybody says up there because, you know, mainland yeah, China is North exactly. Hong Kong. Why are you working so hard up there? Come back down here. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, but I, I've always liked a challenge and, and, and actually a lot of people come to work for me. They afterwards, they say, I mean, they, they say, oh, wow. Like I didn't realize Sarah is such a hard worker <laughs> and people will think, oh yeah, she must just be sitting around having afternoon tea all day. Or some people be like, oh, do you actually go to the office? But I'm always the first to be my office and the last to leave. I usually come an hour before my, my, my staff and I stay probably another hour after they leave. Um, so it's, it is tiring for sure. Um, but I think that what I do gives me so much purpose and the last, since 2012, so I've been here for eight years now, um, the first six years were really just the etiquette school. And I worked, I mean, it was just insane work. I was flying three cities a week, to teach. A lot of students were coming to Beijing and Shanghai to teach where our physical schools were. Um, I would be teaching weekends. Weekends were really busy for me. I'd be entertaining students and, and, and having dinners, on, we, we work dinners on weekday nights. So it was very, very tiring. And now I'm at the stage where, okay, you know, I've built, I've, I did just that. And the foundation and base is strong enough for me to think about what I can build on top of that. Um, so, it, so to me, it's like, okay, I've planted the seeds and the roots have grown. And now it's about, okay, seeing like what kind of shoots these, these seeds can produce. It's, things are starting to blossom now. Um, where does it come from? You know, some of my, a lot of friends ask me that. I think it does, part of it does come from having a very demanding mother who I could never please. Um, who, when I got 98%, the first question was, where's the other 2%? Whenever I got 100%, first question was, let's see if you can get 100% next time. Um, so I think I always did, and, and I don't think it's necessarily a health thing, you know, to always feel like you have to prove something. To th to, to pr and at the end of the day, who are you really proving to, you know? So, um, but, but I do, more importantly, get a lot of joy out of what I do. Um, and what's so exciting is that in no other place do you have an opportunity like in China to be able to make an impact and add value to so many people's lives. I think it's fascinating, the parental piece. I think a lot, for a lot of the listeners out there that are looking for that fire, for that drive, there is something in this concept that hard parenting helps you later in life. And so I, I have a three-year-old and I absolutely adore him. I just, and I can never imagine being hard on him because I just, love him laughing that's my favorite thing but i also fear my, my my mother kicked me out of home at 15 years old and i come i came from a privileged background and i think that that is what lit my fire 
You know, that, right, I'm on my own now. I'm going to prove her wrong, <laughs> prove the world wrong. And I'm going, you know, that, that's what lit my fire. Do you feel like, you know, you mentioned the sad uh, fact that your mum died when you, you know, and when you were 21, I think you said. You know, do, you, do you think that was the spark moment where suddenly, you know, she wasn't there anymore, but all of her hard work had suddenly, you know, matured in you? Do you think that's possibly how? Um, I think... No, that it's not like that wasn't actually a turning point for in terms of my drive. Um, and, uh, and if you think about it, I mean, so I was actually the kind of child that needed to be pushed. Um, because I, I mean, I was intelligent, but I was pretty lazy. So I think that if I didn't have a mother to push me, I would not have received the education that I did to go into better institutions. Um, when I went to Phillips Exeter, which is kind of considered the, the Harvard of boarding schools. So the one single school, at least when I was there, the, the university that we sent most students to was Harvard. And the high school that Harvard accepted most students from was Phillips Exeter. Um, and it's, an, it, it's, it's a beautiful school. Mark Zuckerberg was a year above me. Um, I mean, it was just the, the, the kids were so talented. And at German Swiss International School, which is where I went in Hong Kong, which was considered a very academic school and one and the best amongst the international schools. Uh, I was a top student. I was always the first one with my hand up. I was always, you know, very, I was a top student. And then I went to Phillips Exeter and I became a very mediocre student. And I looked around and there were all these American kids whose parents were not tough on them at all. I mean, the American, the American parenting is very, very different from Asian parenting. They're much more laissez-faire. And, uh, but they were so self-driven and they were good not only at, you know, history, literature, et cetera. They were also better than me at mathematics and science. And they would, they would try varsity athletes. So they would do swimming and diving and cross country at a varsity level. And they would sing and dance. I, I mean, it was just a whole different level. I was so intimidated. In Hong Kong, I was part of the, my high school debate team and we won second prize in, uh, in the Hong Kong standard debate club, uh, my year. And I was actually the youngest on our team. I was, I was 14. The other two was about 18. I went to America and I did, it entered one debate competition at Phillips Exeter. And I was so, I mean, we debated against other schools and I did so poorly that I just never debated again in my life. Um, and I, and then I thought, wow, like these kids are really amazing and inspiring. And then, and then that, inspired me to up my game on my own. And, uh, and after that, actually, when I graduated from Georgetown, I had a very high GPA um, and my mom never had to worry about my, my studies again. Um, So, but then when I think about the job, okay, so the jobs that I did after Georgetown, I went into investment banking, which is considered a very type A competitive industry. And I didn't necessarily go into it for the right reasons. Um, I went into it, you know, I was an English major, and, and you have no idea what you want to do when you're 20, 21. But I just looked around at the people that I admired, who I thought were very driven and very motivated. And they were going into two industries, investment banking or consulting. And so I thought, well, then that's what I want to do. I want to go to work for Goldman Sachs or, you know, I mean, I was, I was really more like attracted to finance than to consulting. Um, and I ended up doing a summer internship with Morgan Stanley and then going to Perella Weinberg, which was a boutique investment bank in New York. Um, and worked very, very, very hard. I mean, I was really burnt out for two years. And then I switched over to nonprofit. Um, and so, so I think that, and then at HBS, I actually had a reputation as a very, as a party girl. You know, I never actually studied for my exams. I would walk in cold. I would just take every exam cold. Uh, I loved being in class. I loved hearing what the professors were saying and being in discussion with, with, with peers um, but to me, HBS was not about getting a, getting a high GPA at all. I went to zero career information sessions. I did not do, I was, I think I was the only person to not do a summer internship because I just wasn't interested. I didn't want to work that summer. Um, and so at times I've been very, very lazy and very unmotivated. Uh, but, and, and so when I started this business, my, so many friends and especially the mainland Chinese classmates who saw me as this kind of very westernized international party girl at, at Harvard Business School, they were like, wow, like, you know, Sarah, we had no idea that you would come to China and 
you'd work so hard and, and you're Mandarin and like a matter of years, you sound like a native. We can't even tell, you know, you, you could fool us. Like you could be from Beijing. Um, and to me, that is actually probably one of the, my biggest achievements of my time in China, that business stuff aside, that I can look and be and act like a local and the locals don't believe I'm not from mainland China. So it's amazing insight. I, I think the other element that we probably would probably disagree on is education, but I'm interested. I, I actually feel like education can hinder you. You get trained, for example, to be a certain thing and then you get stuck being that certain thing. But it sounds like you managed to leverage education for what you wanted out of it and not let it train you to be something else. How do you feel about education? That's right. That's right. And and so I think in the beginning, so when I was at uh, when I was at boarding school, um, I didn't get into Harvard. I got rejected from Harvard for undergrad because my GPA wasn't good enough because I didn't get my act together quickly enough because my first year, which was a transition year, I did, was a very average student. Um, so when I was at Georgetown, then I realized, okay, it's really important for me to get my GPA up so that I can get a good job. And ultimately, I do want to go to potentially get an MBA. So when I graduated, I had 3.75 GPA. And every weekend, 10 a.m., you know, for Saturday morning, I was, at the, I was at the library. I was very studious at Georgetown. Um, and then I realized, and then when I went to HPS, like, cause I knew I didn't want to get a banking or a traditional job where you apply and where your GPA matters. So, and even when I went in, my dad said, and he would say this publicly, he'd say the one thing Sarah, I hope Sarah doesn't do is he's like, Sarah, I have no expectations of you, except please do not fail. Please do not fail out of Harvard business school. So dad, like, are you kidding me? I was a 3.75 GP at Georgetown. Like, what are you talking? You have nothing to worry about. And then when I got to Harvard Business School, um, the way you get a grade is on a bell curve. And so the top in this particular class, the bottom 10% get a grade three, the, the top 10% get a grade one, and the middle 80% get a grade two. And so everybody's saying, oh, it's really hard to get a three. It's really hard to get a three. So I thought, well, it's impossible to get a three. And so that's why I never studied for any exam, walked in cold. And um, my first semester, I got two threes. <laughs> and, I, and in fact, but I would calculate what was, I'd know exactly, okay, I'm going to get a three in this, that's fine. But then what do I need to get a two to at least, you know, be able to pass and go into the next semester. And at the end of my second year, I actually almost failed out of Harvard Business School. Um, if I did not rewrite an essay for an independent study, the professor was going to give me a three, at which point I would not graduate. So I literally graduated by the skin of my teeth. I knew it. And I really spent half of business school focusing on other things such as socializing, being surrounded by incredible people who are at the top of their game across every single industry, um, soaking up what the professors had to offer, but at the same time doing a lot of thinking a lot of thinking about what do I want to do with my life? Where do I want to be? You know, what, what inspires me? And so that's what I really use my two years at Harvard Business School for. I feel there's a theme with you, which is basically enjoy what you do. I feel like you took that experience and you just enjoyed it. And I feel like you're doing that with your businesses. I feel, I feel like that's a theme for you, which is probably somewhat ironic because your mother was probably telling you to it's not about enjoying it, it's about getting the marks, but somehow in, in between the cracks, you found a way of enjoying these hard moments. I do. And, you know, my parents, they didn't always agree to buy me a new dress or a new toy. In fact, they often said no. They were very, very strict with me. But whenever it came to me wanting to buy a book or to learning a language or to learn, picking up a new hobby, no expense was spared. So that's why... When I enrolled for German Swiss International School, my dad said, the summer before, the only place for you to learn German is Germany. And so I did a series of summer camps in Germany. So when I speak German, I actually, I mean, if, if you're on the phone with me and I spoke German, you probably would, you would think I'm German. Um, when I wanted to learn French, my dad sent me to be a Ritz. Uh, horse riding, my dad hired the top coach in Hong Kong. Um, so... So I think that I've been very, very lucky. And that's actually what I would pass on when, you know, when I have a children in the future, um, that education is really the most important thing, but other things, I'm not going to spoil them. 
I love it. Well, you, you, I always end the podcast with this kind of final question, which I think you began to answer there, which is if you went back to your younger self and gave some advice, wh- what would it be? Oh, there's so much advice because I've, I feel like I've made so many mistakes. Um, I think that, I think that one thing I didn't really learn until after 30 was, uh, the power of indifference. Um, and there's a term in Chinese, which is fu si. So fu is Buddha and si is kind of like style or, or, or system. So those, it's like the Buddha way of thinking. And, and it's actually a very popular term in Chinese culture now. It's to be chill about everything. And it's used to describe young people, mainly those born in the 90s or 2000s, who don't buy into aspirational society. Um, but for me, fu si is more about like, it's no, it's, you, you, can't, you can't want something too hard. You can't, you can't let something affect you too much. Um, and it's, it's also something that my dad taught me because I had, uh, I had, I was upset about something. I had a disagreement with a, um, a family member and, uh, and I was really upset and I thought I was treated very unfairly. Um, and, uh, and my dad said, well, the last thing you should let him know is actually one of my cousins who, who, I, who I'm super tight with. Um, you know, he's like the, 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 don't, 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 don't let him know that it affected you. And, and, you know, it shouldn't affect you because it's not that big a deal at the end of the day. So, you know, the, the, the last thing you want to do when you are really upset about something necessarily, unless it's a, unless it's a love relationship or, you know, a, a friendship, which I think it's very important to, to, to reveal the feelings, but, but if it's, business related, or if it's just kind of like really not that important, um, then I think that when you, when you rise above it and when you show, Oh, well, okay, sure. It didn't matter to me anyway. You know, I didn't really mind if, if I got to do that or didn't get to do that, then actually, firstly, you have the upper hand. And secondly, you're not letting it get to you. Good advice. Yeah, I I, um, I completely agree. And I think there's, there's it's an interesting difference between, like you're saying, the relationships that you have and how you have to be very transparent about your feelings. And then sometimes in business, I always say you should take business personally, but there's certain elements that are sometimes also about perspective. So I have exactly the same feeling. Sometimes I, I'm upset about something with someone in business and I think it's personal to me what they've done, but in reality, it's their own issue. <laughs> right? It's actually often not to do with you. So anyway, it's great advice. Look, you, you I could talk to you all day long and so um, I absolutely would love it if you came back on the show in the future and shared more of your insights I'd love to go much deeper on things like education and and the political structure and educate people more around those things but I think today your insights on you as an entrepreneur your story are in, both inspirational and useful and I just want to sum up some of the things that I've taken from it so that um, people who are listening to the end of the podcast have to go back and listen to the rest of it but I do think the power of injustice is a very interesting uh, element and I do completely agree with you and I think people that haven't picked up on that should go back and listen to what you've said about this I also like your uh, explanation of education and how you dealt with um, not only getting good grades, but but how you actually took the best from education. Because I'm always advocating that education is a waste of time, and I'm wrong. I think sometimes with certain personality profiles, if you treat education in the way that you have as a, I'm going to enjoy my summer off, I'm not going to be an intern, I'm not going to follow the system completely, I'm going to leverage the system to learn what I want to learn. I think that's a brilliant difference to how I put things, and I really like it. I, I love um, your father's philosophy of do your best, I'm going to take that uh, and remember to say that to my son. So thank you for that. I like the concept as well that your dad used to say no downside. I think a lot of people look too deep into what failure means. I mean, ultimately it means you just get to start again and actually building is the fun part. So the no downside bit is something people need to think about more. And at the beginning of the podcast, you talked about being authentic and it's something that uh, I don't think could be said enough. And you are certainly one of those people. So thank you so much, Sarah, for giving us your time. I look forward to having you back on the show. And I wish you luck with your ventures in China. And I hope that uh, we'll soon hear of all your ventures here. I think we need etiquette in London, to be honest. We need etiquette in New York. People just um, need to be educated. You might be too early, um, right on time in China, but it, maybe it's too early here. But people here need what you're talking about. So thank you so much for doing what you're doing. Thank you, Simon. And actually, um, people in listening to a podcast can get some etiquette tips for me 
by following my Instagram handle, which is at Sarah Jane Ho, Sarah, S-A-R-A, no H. Um, and so, you know, I, I every other day I, I put a little fun etiquette quote up there. And, uh, and actually, if there are any cool products, niche premium lifestyle products that are interested in coming to China through a premium platform, my, my wonder shop, um, in testing the Chinese market, please, uh, you know, ask Simon for my contact. I will put all of your contact details in the bottom of the Spotify, Apple Music and YouTube uh, broadcasts so people that want to get um, information on you or want to connect to you on, on social media handles or want to launch a product in China. I mean, I can't, there's so many people that dream of doing that. So the fact that the, anyone listening to this podcast today now finally has someone they can trust, um, which is often what people perceive as they don't have for someone in China, you have someone to so stop complaining get off your butt, go build a business, contact Sarah if you want it to work in China. So Sarah, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Simon. Thank you for listening to the Good Luck Club podcast. We know you have thousands of podcasts you could be listening to and you've chosen us. We, of course, feel lucky. If you want to hear more, please go to thegoodluckpod.com or go to any of our social media pages and share with us your views, your insights, and any way that we can improve what we're doing to make it a better experience for you. We wish you the best of luck.